Malcolm to this beautiful June. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may your word speak to our hearts. May your word uplift us. May your word instruct us. And may your word lead our steps. In the name of Jesus, amen. The first sermon ever preached on Australian soil by a Christian was on the 3rd of February, 1788. The Reverend Richard Johnson, chaplain of the penal colony of New South Wales, preached from Psalm 116. Today we read that whole psalm because Paul quotes it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. He said, I believed, therefore I spoke. That was the psalmist's experience. And Paul said, that is my experience. I believe, therefore I speak. And it's our experience. We believe, and therefore we speak. Going back to the psalm, it starts off magnificently. I love the Lord because he has heard my cry for mercy. How many here can say amen to those three lines? <coughs> Out of your experience, I am sure all of you could say amen to those three lines. Because he has turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. Here is a great motive for prayer to call constantly on the name of the Lord. Then in verse 3, he says, The ropes of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Those words put together the experience of so many I'm sure all of you in some time of your life could say, yes, those words describe what I've been through in life. And Paul says, they describe what I've been through. I've been afflicted, but not crushed. I've been perplexed, but not in despair. I've been persecuted, but not abandoned. I've been struck down but not destroyed. Paul says, those words describe what I've been through. And it describes what you've been through too. You've been through fires. Many of you have been through cancer, family sorrow, poverty, sickness, loneliness, Separation from loved ones, loss of income, pressure and stress. And then, as the psalmist says, I called on the name of the Lord, Lord save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Doesn't the psalmist sum up human life, human experience so well and puts it into those words which we can say, <laughs> Amen, Amen. And in verse 10 he says, I believed, and so I spoke. Through all my trials, Lord, I trusted you. So now I can speak of your goodness to me. And in verses 12 to 18, it speaks of praise offered to God for all his goodness that the psalmist experienced. The psalmist 
bears testimony to God's goodness in life. And Paul wants to bear testimony to God's goodness to him in rescue him from danger. And I know that here in the congregation, you love to tell each other how God has been good to you in the way he has rescued you and delivered you. And through those trials, you trusted God and he was true to his promises. You believe and so you speak. And there is mighty power in a personal testimony. There's a lady in the Aboriginal church in Canberra who is 81 years of age. Three times a week she has to travel to have dialysis of her kidney. And then she has other medical appointments through the week. During the week, she makes up food hampers to give to Aboriginal families who are doing it tough in Canberra and Queanbeyan. And last year, she distributed 300 of these food hampers. And for the children, it's included a, a small book of Bible stories. And in 223, she was nominated for the Senior Volunteer of the Year on ABC Radio. And she won. And she was interviewed on ABC Radio in Canberra. And the interviewer asked her, how do you do it all? You've got family to look after. You've got health issues. Three times a week, you have to go to dialysis. And she replied instantly, the Lord, the Lord. Without him, I could do nothing. She believed, and so she spoke. How did we get through the fires? How did you get through the sickness? How did you get through personal tragedy? The Lord, he is gracious and righteous, full of compassion. You believed his promises, and so you speak. And testimony is so powerful. And Paul's motivation of preaching the gospel is exactly the same. I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and so I speak about his greatness and his wonder. Why did Paul have such confidence in God's power? It was because God the Father raised the Lord Jesus Christ from, from the dead and will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself. The resurrection is so mighty and so central to the Christian faith. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says to all Christians, let's be realistic about life. Let's put aside emotion. Let's put aside sentiment. Let us look clearly in the cold light of logic about life. He says, if Christ is not raised from the dead, Every Christian is still in their sin, still burdened with sin. He said, if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, our faith is worthless. We're trusting a dead person, not a living person. Our faith is just pure imagination. Christ didn't rise from the dead, we have no hope <coughs> beyond death. When we're dead, we're dead.
and we're no different from any other person in the world blindly trying to find their way through life. And Paul says, if we put hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone else. We are a sad crew. But, says Paul, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is 100% true. Jesus is alive today. It happened in history. There is an empty tomb and there are 500 witnesses who saw him alive and you can go and speak to them, he was saying to the, his current readers. Jesus has conquered death. Our faith is not in vain. Our hope is real. And one day, we too will be raised from the dead, just as Jesus was, and join Paul and all other believers and be presented to God, as it says at the end of Jude. Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless in the presence of his glory without blemish, and exceeding joy. Jesus shares his victory with us. I've told you before about Lance Armstrong. He won the Tour de France six times. And those titles have all been taken away from him because he was a drug cheat. But there was one thing that was really impressive about Lance Armstrong to me, that when he won those tours, he won $20 million. He gave a third of it to cancer research. He gave a million dollars to each of his 10 team members. And he just took the rest. He shared his victory with his team. But Jesus, because he is God, is able to share all of his victory, 100% of it, and all of its benefits with us. No wonder that in the book of Acts, every sermon by an apostle features the resurrection. And it's the very basis of the Christian faith. The Christian faith stands and falls upon the resurrection of Jesus. And you know that hymn, that song, Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. For I know who holds the future and life is worth the living because he lives. In verse 15, Paul says, it's all grace. All of that comes from the loving heart of God, an overflow of generosity to undeserving sinners. And this message of the resurrection is passed on to others. And when it's passed on and believed in, it's going to result in thanksgiving to God which brings glory to God. How sweet is the sound of thanksgiving. It is music to my ears. God is so good every day to us. So much we have because of his goodness. And you know, Aussies are great complainers. If there was an Olympic event for complaining, Australia would be up there in the medal contention. Let our hearts, let our mouths be filled with thanksgiving for God. And may that sound of thanksgiving increase over all the earth. 
two weeks ago, uh, an Indian pastor called K.T. Yohannan was struck down by a car as he was walking in India. Uh, this man had helped to plant hundreds and hundreds of churches in India. And the passion that dominated his, that his life in a multi-religious place like India was this. I want as many people as possible to have the opportunity to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And the more that know Christ, the more thanksgiving there is, and the more is God glorified. That was Paul's goal in life. And I hope it is our goal, especially as a church. In verse 16, Paul goes on to say, Therefore we do not lose heart. We have a great gospel. We have a great goal before us. Though outwardly we are wasting away, Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Paul knew by personal experience that he, his body was taking hit after hit after hit. And he wasn't getting any younger. But Paul knew the power of the risen Christ. He knew the grace of God. He knew the joy of thanksgiving. And he never gave up proclaiming the gospel. In 2 Timothy, he says towards the end of his life, which was nearly 60 years of age, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He never never gave up. It's so easy to give up today. Especially as Christians. There is pressure from social media. There is the very spirit of the age. There's a desire to be popular. There's the pace of life. There's the lack of encouragement and support. And all these things wear us away. And even being part of a church, it's easy to give up. We're getting older. We should be living with comfort and ease. We've got no pastor. We've got too many other things to attend to. Paul says, never give up, never give up, never lose heart. And he says, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Now that's a great encouragement to everyone here in this church. Who's not wasting away day by day. How good is God? He never forgets us. Every day he wants to refresh us, renew us in our hearts. Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for his mercies never end. They are new every morning, Great is your faithfulness. I say the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will put my hope in him. So wrote Jeremiah in the book of Lamentations. And Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flowing deep from within. We might have wrinkles. 
We might have aches and pains and strains. We might be getting slower and creakier and more forgetful. But inside, we're getting stronger, more spiritually healthier and happier. Praise be to God. He will never forsake us or forget us. And then in verse 17, Paul says, Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs all the troubles. In Romans 8, 17, he says, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy compared with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 12, If we endure, we will also reign with Christ. Every day we weigh things up, don't we? You go to Woolies or Coles. Is this packet of chips worth more than that packet of chips? Will I buy an electric car or keep a fuel-driven one? Or maybe I'll buy a hybrid. We're always comparing things, weighing them up. And Paul says there's no comparison between the eternal glory that we're going to receive and the suffering, pain, rejection, persecution we might face here on earth. God has got something better in store for each one of us, regardless of the difficulty and the struggles we go through here on earth. In verse 18, Paul says, Get perspective. Don't fix our eyes on what is seen, but what is unseen. Not on what is temporary but what is eternal? God wisely, lovingly, joyfully made each one of us for fellowship with himself. To love, revere and trust him in all things. But humanity, and we included, have taken our eyes off God and focused them on created things. And Jesus is like a spec saver store. You go to him and he'll give you a new pair of glasses. He'll give them to you so you get an eternal perspective upon life. But you will see life properly. And it will enable you to see that the love of God, the love for others, joy and peace and righteousness and faithfulness and gentleness and kindness, serving others and self-control are far more important than lots of money, endless assets, popularity and fame here on earth. And the brand of the glasses that he gives to you are called eternity. So that we can see life as it's meant to be seen. And so Paul moves to the next chapter. In chapter 5, verse 1, he says, For we know this earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal home in heaven, not built with human hands. I think most of you here are old enough to remember a song which went, This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up, way up beyond the blue. Angels beckon me, from heaven's distant shore 
because I can't feel at home in this world anymore. We are citizens of two countries. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven and we're citizens of Australia where we all have temporary visas. The kingdom of heaven is our permanent home and our future address. Now Paul knew all about tents. He was a tent maker. And uh, many people in that day lived in tents. That was their home. But even the best of tents are fragile, uh, are subject to the weather, to the heat, the wind and the rain. Who of you would like to have been living in a tent on Friday? <laughs> and Paul says, our earthly tents refer to our bodies. Our bodies are fragile, subject to disease and dis decay. But one day, our fragile, temporary bodies will be changed into a glorious body. As he says in Philippians 3.21, he will transform the body of our humiliation into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. In 1 John chapter 3, he says, we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we will see him as he is. This earthly tent will be replaced by a building, a body fit for heaven, eternally given to us by God. No matter what pain, what trial, what suffering, what persecution we face here on earth. We have a powerful God who rescues us, who strengthens us, who has an amazing future plan for each one of us. And he wants to glorify us in his presence. Nothing can separate us from that amazing love us pray. O Lord, as you were with Paul, so you are with us. That nothing can separate us from your amazing love. And Lord, we thank you for the witness of the resurrection. That you are a living Saviour and Lord. And may you walk with us this week as we bear witness to you with thanksgiving in jesus name amen